name's Matt Widgery from mattwidgery.com. Today's episode is going to be slightly different. It's going to be an extended hour-long episode, roughly, give or take, because there's quite a few questions to get through. And I'm here with Katie Fig, who is a fantastic photographer. She works in uh, the field of music, and she's been published in a number of magazines. And is also, she works in the wedding sphere as a designer as well. Yeah. And Katie got in touch with me recently, and she wanted to um, have a chat with me about uh, that transition into doing creative stuff on a full-time basis rather than sort of dovetailing it in with a, a full-time job or with other work. So what I thought would be really quite a cool idea to do would be to get a video going so that we can actually share this conversation with you guys and you can join in in the comments below and let us know if you've got any thoughts on what we're talking about. So we've gathered together a section of questions that Katie has um, for herself and also we've been talking to you guys out on Facebook and on LinkedIn um, who've been very kind enough also to supply us with some questions so that we can make this a bit more holistic and, and sort of hopefully touch on a number of the points that I think are probably common not only to just photographers but to other creatives who are making that exciting but terrifying sometimes leap into the unknown. Yeah. So Katie, I'm going to leave the floor open to you, you okay. are now the interviewer. So. <laughs> okay, so um, start with the first question mm. which is um, how do you pick a good business name? So do you go with something quirky and different? Mm. Do you stick with just your own name? Mm -hmm. Or do you go with something a bit more generic? Mm. Really good question. I mean, I think the, the thing to think about is uh, how you want to be positioned, not just now, not just in a year's time, but moving forward, are you still going to want to be doing exactly the same thing now? And also, are you going to want to bolt other components onto what you do? Mm -hmm. If you know that you're just going to be a wedding photographer, okay, and you know that that's the career that you want and you want to be very specific about that, really become an expert, a specialist, then you can go for, you know, something that's uh, connected to maybe wedding photography, you could call it, you know, wedding bells images or, or whatever it is, you know, Bellevue photography or something like that, uh, because it's going to be tied very nicely into what you do. If you're maybe planning on doing a few different things, so for example you might be doing a bit of wedding photography, you might also be wanting in the future to branch out and do maybe some music videos, maybe you want to also write, maybe you want to do public speaking, maybe there's a bunch of other things that you want to do. To build your brand equity up along all these different platforms it makes much more sense to go for something that is connected to you personally mm -hmm as opposed to something that's specifically towards a particular genre. So mm -hmm. um, in that case, I would go for katiefig.com as opposed to uh, bellevueweddings.com. Yeah. So it depends, and it's worth really thinking about before you sort of set, set up all your business cards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, have a think what your, what your five-year plan is, what your 10-year plan is. Is it something where you're very specific or are you wanting to bolt on other components as time goes on? So were you always mm -hmm. going to be Matt Widgery Photography? There was never a question of having a name or a alter ego as it were do you know in my case it actually was uh, right. <laughs> so um, I and I still own the domain name anarchicimage.com okay. um, I was shooting a lot of protest stuff and um, it was kind of cool avenue to go down and I also thought it worked quite well with the music side of things as well because um, I'm a big punk fan and it kind of worked with that so um, I, I set up a lot of stuff around that and I, I initially had a blog that ran alongside that and, and, and all that sort of stuff but it caught me out because I hadn't thought of this when I started that particular website, I hadn't considered that maybe I might want to work more in the commercial and mm -hmm. corporate spheres where anarchy is not such a, yeah. <laughs> such a cool buzzword, right? <laughs> they they yeah. want somebody that's kind of reliable and professional as opposed to somebody that's anarchic and off the wall. Yeah. So this is the thing, you have to kind of position your brand and we'll drill down in this video a little bit about you know, how, you, how you brand yourself as a, as a business and as an individual versus uh, you know what your, your sort of you know your company name is and things like that because you know it does have a huge impact you know um, the, the people that you're wanting to do business with you want something that's kind of friendly to them and they'll click onto mm. so I then changed everything over and became mattwidgery.com across the board so I'm mattwidgery.com if I'm shooting a wedding I'm mattwidgery.com if I'm doing uh, workshops I'm mattwidgery.com if I'm you know on uh, YouTube I, it's the same across every platform and you know people will talk to me about different things but my brand equity remains uh, good in the centre because everything all links lead back to me. So all the SEO stuff is leading back to me. So, you know, as, as people review what I do, if it's uh, an exhibition or if it's uh, you know, a, a you know, nice sort of comment that a client's made, mm -hmm. you know, people searching for my name, they find all that stuff from different genres and it gives me a, a level of uh, trust within the market. Fantastic. Okay, so should I form a limited company or 
be a sole trader? Again, really, really good question. And it does depend a lot on what you want to do with the business moving forward. Uh, if It depends how much, to a certain extent, it'll depend how much money you plan on, on, on making as well, because uh, that'll have an impact just in terms of tax and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, with a limited company, as you grow, you're going to give yourself a lot easier time if the risk is suffered by the company as opposed to by you as an individual. Mm -hmm. So with a limited company, um, the company becomes effectively an entity in law. Um, it means that, for example, if you get sued because you go on a shoot and a light stand drops down on the bride and decapitates her, um, <laughs> then it'll be the company that, um, that, that gets sued yeah. and it can push the company under, but they can't come and, and sort of take away your assets. They can't come and take yeah. your house and stuff like that. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't give you carte blanche necessarily to capitate too many brides. It, they look <laughs> terrible in the photos anyway, um, and uh, they don't rebook. Um, but um, on a serious note, it does depend on if you want to, you know, give yourself that little bit of protection, go down the com uh, limited company route. Also, um, you know, if you want to employ more people in the future, you know, some mm -hmm. people are happy just being a, a sole trader, but it might get to the point where, you know, you want to set up a studio and then you want to maybe hire assistants or other photographers, or you might want to incorporate into your business model, you know, a design aspect and a photography aspect mm -hmm. and things like that as you go forward. And then you're going to need other people coming in, maybe a studio manager, you know, maybe other people. And in which case, having something set up as a limited company, which is able to support them through like a PAYE structure and things yeah. like that is really important. Yeah. And there's been, I think it was in April this year, there has been changes in legislation. So a lot of companies that hire uh, contractors and that mm. want them set up as limited company yeah. just because it's easier yeah. for pay aspects. So, yeah, that's yeah. it. I mean, HMRC are really trying to sort of link everything much yeah. more tightly than it has been because, you know, with a sole trader, you don't have to, you know, make your records publicly aware for example you don't yeah. have to report to the company's house or anything like that and so you know HMRC are very keen that everybody pays the correct tax at the right time and, mm -hmm. and is transparent about what they do um, and obviously as a sole trader then um, there's no you know requirement at this stage to have something and you're absolutely right you know it will quite or it will happen more often in the future now that if you get hired as a photographer for a corporate job or for a commercial job they may well want you to be a limited company whereas in the past it was much more relaxed and you know they could actually just put the money through um just by doing a bax transfer or something so yeah yeah, yeah absolutely okay so um facebook mm. is facebook dead um if so what social media platforms are the best to use and uh can you just get sales from social media okay first question is first part of the question is Facebook dead this is something that that, that creeps up on social media mm -hmm. every sort of I would say about every two weeks there's an yeah. article saying Facebook's dead it's had it um, and it, I think largely it's people got very um, resentful because they changed the goalposts halfway through the game yeah which is a bit un unfair what, what I don't think is unfair though is how it is now I actually think it's brilliant and I'll come on to why but the reason why people got upset was because when you first set up your uh, you know, your creatives fan page, so you know, if you're writing, you're filmmaking, or you're photography, mm -hmm. uh, and you uh, got your fan base going, so you invited everybody to come and like your page, um, you, you drove traffic through it from your website, which had a certain amount of equity, or from your YouTube channel, or from your Twitter account, or Instagram, or whatever it was, maybe you paid to put some adverts on there and actually spent some money to gather some likes in, so you, did, you were invested in it financially as well. So you built up your 100 likes, 1,000 likes, million likes on Facebook, now, the problem was, in the first instance, you used to then, when you put a post out, everybody would see it. Yep. Now what happens is that there's an algorithm, it used to be called EdgeRank, they changed it now, I don't know mm -hmm. what it's called, but they changed it in March this year and refined it and took the name away because it had a bit of a bad, a bit of a, it was a dirty reputation, basically. Right. But I actually think it's brilliant. What they then said was that they were only going to give people content that they effectively wanted to see. So they worked out, when you put a, a post on Facebook, how quickly it was picked up, liked, commented, shared, clicked through, and then they would determine based on that first sort of tranche of people looking at it, how many more people would get to see it down the road. Right. Now, this meant that if you had 10,000 people on your uh, page, it was quite possible that maybe only 1,000 of them were gonna see your post or maybe 500 or 200. And of course, people were pretty furious about this. Mm. But the reason I actually think it's a very good thing is because the other, the other model is Twitter. Now, Twitter is an absolute nightmare because everything gets posted. And yeah. so you're, you're, you're on your, 
you know, sort of iPhone or your iPad or whatever, and you're scrolling through like that, and there's so much stuff there that is completely nonsense and random, because a lot of people, and we'll come on to sort of good techniques for social media, but a lot of people don't use it particularly well, so they're using it really just to distribute content rather than talk natively in the platform and try and engage an audience and build a community. They're just trying to sell stuff through it. And our, our bullshit filter is very, very, uh, is very quick to trigger these days. And so, you know, we are just scrolling through this stuff. Facebook were very clever. They took the stuff out that was buy my trainers, 10% off my photography workshop, come and get my wedding invites, mm -hmm. you know. They filtered that stuff out very, very quickly. And because the stuff that, you know, actually people want to talk to is people that talk to them like a human being. And what tends to get the best reaction on things like Facebook is if you engage with people, ask them questions, respond to their questions, mm -hmm. start to build a community where you're getting to know individuals as a human being. And they're the posts that do well and they're the posts that edge rank or whatever it's called now tend to pick up on. So whilst there's a huge amount of um, sort of, I don't know, uh, bad feeling at the moment towards Facebook, I actually think that what they've done is incredibly strong. Um, the other nice thing about Facebook, if you've got money to spend on campaigns, is something called dark posts. Mm -hmm. um, dark posts are incredible. I mean, what, what they allow you to do, um, you can actually put out, because normally if you put a, like a, a sponsored advert like that comes up in someone's newsfeed from your page, everybody that EdgeRank decides will see it, will see it, and it'll stick on your page as well. So anybody that comes and visits your page will see that. So it makes it very, very hard to test messaging. So if you want to have, say, um, you know, you want to put out a campaign, you want to test five different versions of that campaign to see which wording is strongest or which photo is strongest with that wording, it's really hard to do that traditionally because it means that everybody's going to see all five images and they're just going to think you've got Tourette's because like, you've got five adverts coming out in three minutes that are mm -hmm. all basically the same thing. But you know, one of them's on a black background, one of them uses um, you know, buy now instead of click here and whatever. So it's kind of really you know, frustrating. Uh, what dark posts allow you to do is post these things to different uh, demographics or different people, but it hides it from your feed yeah. so that your people aren't actually seeing it. And that means that you can maintain your brand's um, messaging and your, your brand identity on Facebook whilst trying out other things and just seeing which stuff catches. Mm -hmm. You need money to put towards that. And it's, you know, it's something that's probably a little bit beyond where I guess a lot of people are going to start with, with what we're talking about here, simply because I don't think that it's necessarily worth spending a lot of money on something mm -hmm. like social media right now. When you first start out, as you get bigger, it is very much, and it's, I would say, you know, a necessity to do so. Um, in terms of other social media sites, um, stuff that works really well, and it does, the, the nice thing about doing stuff in, in the creative sphere, particularly something that's visual, is that there's a ton of really cool platforms out there that can really engage with people. So obviously you've got stuff like Instagram and Pinterest. Pinterest is good because people look at different social media with, with, with different, um, uh, there's different reasons they're going to be there. You know, people go on social, people go on Facebook because it's kind of people they know and they want to hang out with the people they already know. You know, people hang out on Google Plus to um, to find other people that like the same stuff as they do. So they'll find other photographers and talk about gear or whatever it is. You know, people go on Twitter to find news and things like that. People that go on Pinterest go to buy. So if you've got a product that's really visual, like for example, wedding invitations, where it's something that's really handmade, really beautiful people will start pinning that and they're in the mood to buy and the conversion rate from those is absolutely sky high. The other really amazing thing, um, and it's not something that I've been particularly um, sort of following too much as yet, simply because I think the demographic is still a little young for my personal market, but it's getting there and it's increasing all the time, is Snapchat. Yeah. You know, Snapchat's fantastic. I mean, the, the thing with that we all struggle with on, on social media is attention. You know, we're trying to yeah. get that as people kind of, you know, scroll past things, we're trying to get people to stop and read the post that we've put and like it and click and comment and share it. And the nice thing about Snapchat is that you have to pay attention to it or it's gone. As soon as you let go of it, it's yeah. disappeared. So it forces people to actually drink in the information. And you can do clever stuff with it. So you can put something on uh, Snapchat that you can then say links back to your website or links back to your Facebook page or links back to a YouTube you've done on, on, you know, on here. Uh, and, and that allows you to then drive traffic from something which is caught someone's attention and push it through to another channel in a way that something like you know saying on Facebook you know look at my next video might not be so effective because people are scrolling through so fast yeah so I think you know ultimately yes I think there are platforms that can make return on investment for social media I think they're changing but I think for creatives you know the visual stuff like snapchat like Instagram like like Pinterest yeah are brilliant I mean they really yeah. are because they they talk to people in in our language yeah and it's all about hashtags it is all about, <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, now, hashtags are brilliant for two things. 
a lot of people use hashtags as their own, they put their own hashtags to things. Yes. So they'll hashtag Casey Fig and, and yeah. uh, put that on there, or hashtag wedding photographers, and I hope people are going to look for them. What's actually much more powerful with hashtags is actually looking for other hashtags. So you look for things, you, you hashtag um, wedding invitation, for example. Yeah. And you can find somebody on there that's saying, oh, you know, I'm looking for wedding invitations for, for my wedding that's coming up in June. Do you know anybody? Yeah. If you can then jump onto that conversation, start a conversation. Don't start with a, you know, buy now, but start with a, you know, say, have you looked at, you know, these are some really cool designs that, that are out at the moment. Yeah, you can do these amazing things with um, like, you know, maybe like a carved wood or a hand folded sort of like handmade paper one or, or natural dyes, whatever it is. Mm. Have, have you looked at And they'll start a conversation about that. Then you can drop in and say, well, tell you what, you know, um, I actually do some of these. I'll send over a, a, a free sample of it. If you like, um, you know, if you like them, maybe you can share it with your friends. The likelihood is that not only they will then come back and book, but all their friends, because mm -hmm. people are in a similar demographic, right? If there's one girl in a group that's getting married the likelihood is she's got a lot of mates that are of a similar age and they might yep. well be too you've got that and you've said something publicly to all those people mm -hmm. about you're going to send them something free you've demonstrated your expertise in the market and things like that so hashtags in terms of finding people as opposed to um, letting people find you is just dynamite yeah. really powerful yeah um, so when it comes to websites mm. do you invest the money and build your own or do you use a, um, a, a like a template site in Wix, Weebly, and do a drag and drop kind yeah. of template? Yeah. What's the best? It depends opinion? how good your skill set is. If you're really brilliant and can set up a WordPress thing with all the little plugins, and you can type it all out in HTML, and you know make it all look brilliant, mm -hmm. and make it look professional, and make it easy to use, and make it look modern, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, by absolutely all means, do it. Um, for me personally, who can't do any of that stuff, I use Squarespace. Mm -hmm. It's a template website. There's like a there's a squillion templates out there. Yeah. It's brilliant for photography because you put your pictures in it, and then they, as you drag the browser around, it automatically resizes. Yeah. When you upload your picture, it basically it saves it in like ten different sizes, and will automatically make it stretch and grow. Um, you get a a, a a version of it which is optimized for mobile and tablet as well, so you don't have to worry about kind of doing that. All the templates will automatically fit into you know whatever device you're using, um, and it's very good. There are limitations with it you know the ones that um that you know you are if you're using a, a, a template system you're kind of there, there are a few plugins that you can use but you know you have to be kind of happy with something fairly basic if you want to start doing e-commerce with it or something a little bit more complex you may want to then start expanding and maybe you know hire somebody that can do that stuff mm -hmm. for you but you know if you're just starting out and you just need somewhere to put your portfolio and your prices and your contact details and you're about me in order to get something that looks slick, it's much, much better to go for something that's a template that you can kind of tweak with a little bit and looks beautiful and works properly rather than just trying to do it all yourself yeah. and then it looks terrible or it doesn't work or it's a funky server that goes down when you've got more than three people looking at it at once and stuff yeah. like that. So, so what about when it comes to uh, people that, you know, creatives that make a product? Mm. So for me, I do typography and design mm. and I, I make greetings cards, wedding stationery, which are all available to buy mm. with typefaces I've designed. Cool. You've got not in the high street, mm. Etsy. Right. Is that a good an, another good platform to get involved with? Or do you try and keep to your keep to yourself? Oh that's the thing. Let me just very quickly ping this um, sorry for me jumping up halfway through the video guys. There we go, sorry yeah. that quick <laughs> We're back. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically the question was whether or not to, um, to, to, to sell your products on other platforms or rather yeah, than so trying to keep it all in place. how important is it to have a website to yourself? Do, you yeah. know, do people look at it? Um, or, you know, if, if you've got a good following on Facebook mm. and you can just, you know, not on the high street, it's at Etsy's on, on Facebook, mm. you can just kind of go, I'm on here. And that's you where you can, find me. Yeah, same as Pinterest. You can do links to, to those sites there. Yeah. You know, how important is it to have your own website? Well, I think, you know, these days the market has shifted a lot. And in the early days, pretty much the only thing that if you wanted to sell stuff online, it was kind of you did it yourself. Mm -hmm. I still think there's a lot of value in kind of having your own gaff online that's yeah. yours and you own yeah. and you, you can kind of control how that looks and how that feels and how people interact with it. So I would always say that regardless of how many other places that you can find this stuff, if you've got a home page with your about details, whether or not people can buy directly, I mean it might be that if you're in the retail space for example that you can't necessarily sell things as you might have contracts with your retailers where it's exclusive stuff so you might not have everything on there, you know, or if you're wholesaling you might not be able to you know do much with the price for example you know you can't undercut your suppliers and things like that so um, 
you know, there's, there's things you have to be careful of if you're in the retail space, but I would always say that it's really important to have your own kind of territory, your own platform mm -hmm. online that you can control and that you know the more places that you can that you can link out to and the more places that you can get out there in the market selling your stuff absolutely the better you know so if you can get it into Etsy get it into all these other places then fantastic but people that are googling you if they can come up and find your name and some stuff about you that's going to build your brand awareness and your credibility and your equity as a brand up because you can really control how that conversation is taking place mm -hmm. the other thing to, um, to 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 be really sort of positive about you know when you have got them um, you know your products on other sites though is that all the review stuff that comes up a lot of these places when you can buy things um, you, the, the customers can leave reviews about what it is that they've bought so if you get a ton of really cool reviews then that's going to be really helpful get on there and start replying if it's a, if they're forum type questions and you can reply to people that's even better and what's really really cool and I actually think this is something that's really undervalued in a lot of industries is um, I actually think there's a lot of positivity that can be gained from uh, like a bad review or a customer complaint a lot of people dread these they think yeah. oh you know somebody said terrible stuff maybe it's not even your fault maybe I don't know like you know the, the wrong order turned up or the post got delayed or I don't know whatever you know it was the wrong color green or something you know these things happen and a lot of people, you know, the first thing people these days do when they've had some bad experience with whoever it is, they'll get online at three o'clock in the morning, they're underpants after a bottle of scotch and they'll, they'll rant, yeah. right? Now, I actually love those because that's an opportunity to then, because it's a really public thing, you can then be really public and amazing back. It's an opportunity that you wouldn't have otherwise had to, to sort of demonstrate how amazing you are. Mm -hmm. So you can say, yeah, go really over the top, you know, say, look, I'm going to, you know, come round and, uh, you know, give you a, a free, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, I'll, I'll do a, a, a free photo shoot for your kids or I'll uh, give you a, um, the, the next typeset that you, you are, I'll, I'll give you that free of charge or something like that. Be absolutely over the top, just, you know, the, the nicest human being that you could ever be. And then everybody that sees that, they'll read that. And the interesting thing about psychology is that when people read other people ranting, it tends to refer, it tends to look worse on them than whatever yeah. it is that they're complaining about just because people tend not to be that rational when they're, when they're really kicking off, so yeah. they'll come across as a ranty loon. But then underneath is Casey Fig, just being the most lovely human being in the world. Yeah. They go, oh, that's so people sweet. People aren't going to complain know. that somebody's too nice. Yeah, exactly, that's <laughs> it. It's like, she's so nice, I'm not dealing business with her. Do you know what I mean? So that's yeah. it. And so you can build a lot of brand equity into that because people, that everybody that then looks at that, regardless of whether or not they buy directly or not, they're going to see you in this amazingly warm light. Yeah. And it's an opportunity you wouldn't have had if that person hadn't complained. Because you can't just sit there and go, yeah, I'm a nice person. You know, well, yeah, so you say, but if you actually have an opportunity to demonstrate and really turn a situation around, then it can be really positive. Yeah, and I think people are quicker to complain than they are to praise as well. Yes, yeah, And yeah. It, So it is something that you have to address. Yeah. And you, you can't just turn your back on it and pretend like it's not happened. No, absolutely. But if you address yeah. it in the right way, like you say, yeah, that's it. The worst thing you can do is, is, is ignore it. Positive. Yeah, if, if somebody looks and they see a, a negative review and then there's, there's nothing after it and it was in 2011, you think, well, do they care? Are they still mm. in business? You know, why aren't they responding? You know, so you have to be really public about this stuff. You know, Google it the whole time. Um, just try and respond to whatever you can as quickly as you can and, you know, good, bad, indifferent. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, you know, the 99% the, the of people that we do business with, they're delighted, but they don't say anything at all. <laughs> so, you know. Um, but we just hope they read book, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so this leads on nicely to advertising. So mm. I know we've, we've touched on the, the internet side, side of, of things, yeah. but um, in, in terms of other advertising, um, when you're starting out, how, how worthwhile is it? Do you invest your money elsewhere? And if you do advertise, where are the best places to do that? Mm. Mm. I think this is a, a really uh, sort of changing question and it's changed so much over the last few years. Ten years ago um, I worked in advertising, I worked in print advertising, I was working for newspapers and our job was to sell big display pages in newspapers, that's what we did. And it was 20 grand for a page and it went out and one day and, and it was gone, mm -hmm. it was disappeared. It was the same questions then as we get with social media now about what's the ROI, um, you know, which in those days it's really hard to prove. These days it's really easy to prove, but people still think you know that's the most you know important thing. It is about touch. Um, these days, a lot of people are very down on, on on traditional media. They say it's dead. You know, don't put print advertising together. Don't put broadcast advertising together. Frankly, you need a budget to do it. And one of the biggest problems is that we're still. We might want to just wait till this. Uh, I hope that's not going to be going all afternoon. Um, just start that. 
bit again. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, you know sort of bad press put out about the press. I say it's bad. But... We may just have to blaze through this, and I think we can probably yeah. do this. I'm just going to turn the gain up on this one a little bit. I can't actually see which way that's going. There we go. All right. Um, so there's a lot of bad press written about press because you know they say you know that it doesn't work anymore. The reality is that um, it, it, it mainly doesn't, but it's good as one of these kind of checkpoints. Mm -hmm. you, you need these touch points with, with any marketing strategy in order to get your um, in order to get people to buy from you. It's not just a question of them seeing you once on Facebook or seeing this video and kind of buying your stuff because they like the way that you presented. That you need to have you know a, a portfolio of places out there and a lot of places out there that people can see you and the more the better the trouble is like a lot of traditional media is overpriced you know they're still pricing themselves as if the internet never happens yeah um so you know the reality is that when you first start out every penny absolutely counts mm -hmm. and you really have to make it work and so the more that you can do by building up um presences on social media that don't require you know an investment the better but if you're the certain uh, sort of industries where you do need to have a, a presence in certain publications because people will expect to see you there and if it's cheap enough I would say have a go at it but you know it really does depend where you're starting from if you're starting from the point of absolute zero with no money to invest in anything and you haven't got any money to invest in uh, in print or especially broadcast which is just ridiculous yeah I would say, you know, there's other ways of doing it. It's slow and it's long, but it's worth it in the long run. And then you own the audience that you, yeah. you know, you own them, but you're, you're, they, they, they respond to you in a much better way because you've built them up over time and hopefully, and we'll come on to this as well, but it's about how you communicate with, with your audience as you grow it. And it's not something that happens overnight, um, but it's so much more rewarding when you get there because you get to know human beings and they know you and it's a, it's a much more interactive thing. It's much more old school. It's like the way our grandparents used to do business. Yeah. We, you know, people used to have like a village shop and like everybody used to go in there and like, you know, they, the, the, the butcher would know like when old Mrs. Smith came in that she liked half a pound of pork sausages and the shop boy would go round and deliver it around her house at the end of the day. And, you know, Mr. Green from across the road would would, um, he always liked, you know, pork on a Saturday, so there'd be some prepared. And he knew everybody's names and when their kids, you know, birthdays were and stuff like that. And oddly enough, that's the kind of business model that now works because of social media. We've got these direct yeah. connections to people, and this is the, this is the business model that makes much more sense to follow now. We start mm -hmm. to learn to know people as human beings, and it takes time to build these relationships as it does in real life. But it's so much more valuable, and you get so much more ROI off it, so much better brand equity off it than you can ever get from just putting an advert into a newspaper. Yeah. But if the advertising is cheap enough, if it's part of a portfolio of other things so that you've got these platforms out there, so you've got, you know, something you can do. Um, and obviously, you know, if you can do PR rather than advertising, even better, you know, get stories in there about you rather than paying for space. Uh, but get something in, you know, the local paper or the industry specific magazine that you work in. Get something on a, a radio station or on a podcast or on a, a blog that's relevant to you in your space. Um, you know, if you can get the local TV to come and cover something that you're doing or you can go to an event that's being covered by somebody and either sponsor it or get invited on as an expert to be interviewed and get your message out through traditional media that way mm -hmm. it can be very powerful because it's still reaching a lot of people you know yeah. it's not dead it's not that there's nobody watching television or you know reading the newspaper anymore it's just that the numbers are less and the ROI on traditional print advertising and broadcast advertising has just dropped to you know practically zero yeah you know I think it's surprising the more you look for these you know, radio shows, mm. um, free publications, the more you find and mm. the more willing people are to ex accept you in and, and help you out as well. Because oh, it absolutely. helps them out as well. Of course it does, you know, yeah. It gives them the, the, the cultural art aspect to their, yeah. to their broadcast or, or, or publication, which, That's right. you know, everyone wants to kind of have more of. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. And, you know, if you're, if you're in, in a space where you're able to provide them content, that's what they're looking for, you know. Mm. In particular, I mean, something like you, where you're doing the type and the fonts and that kind of stuff. If you're able to to talk to, to magazines and print, uh, you know, publications that need that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, you can really sort of uh, you know, create something very powerful for them and very unique, which is going to allow their publication to stand out a hell of a lot. And through offering some kind of partnership, where maybe you create some nice fonts for them or create some nice typesetting for them, 
then that's going to give them a, a, a unique perspective and, and generate some interest for them. And then when you've got a new product out, they're probably more likely to talk about it and interview you for their magazine and things like that. Yeah. So it's, it's all recipro reciprocal. And okay. So, yeah, so uh, the best way to build a client base. Well, this is, yeah, this is kind of what we started talking yeah. about a second ago. I mean, this is, the, this is what I really, really love about um, starting a business in the 21st century. I mean, I think it's the most exciting time to be able to do this because... Mm -hmm. You know, 20 years ago, it was it was the traditional stuff. If you wanted to, to get a business out, you would go and you'd, you'd rent one of these units here. You'd have a little shop going. You'd um, sit in there and you'd either hope that people would see you because they'd walk past you on the street or you'd put an advert in the yellow pages or in the local paper and you'd sit back and you'd wait for the phone to ring. Yeah. These days, you can be actively building a community of people that you can follow and that follow you and you can talk to and they can talk to you like actual human beings and develop friendships and develop relationships with people that then become your client base so it's really cool so you know social media is great for that you know the youtube channel that i'm doing here um you know some of you i'm just been really grateful because you've been following it right since the beginning i've not been doing this very long i started i put my first video up in about march something like that in that time i've put up like 35 videos um it's got it's, it's starting to increase now in terms of the views that i'm getting on them all like for, to start with you get nothing and it's the same and this is what makes a lot of people look at this strategy and they try it for six weeks and they don't get anything mm -hmm. off it and they go no social media isn't for me you know, I put a YouTube channel up and I think I got seven views and, yeah. uh, you know, I put up a Facebook page and, you know, a Facebook page is a classic one. You put your Facebook page up, you invite all your friends off your normal page. So yeah. like your mum joins and your best mate joins <laughs> and like her brother joins and then that's it. Right? Yeah. You might get three likes in the next year. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. You know, yeah. Yeah, I've tried it. You know, I've done that. And it is. It's, it's consistency and it's putting out good content and it's communicating with people and it's so much more important and this is the other thing that people get wrong on social media all the time so much more important than the content that you put out is the interactions you have with the people that are already there yeah. so rather than worrying about you know sort of the, the most perfectly crafted you know sort of photo of a cat you can put on you know facebook or the most carefully crafted I don't know, a uh, pictogram of like, you know, how many weasels you can juggle, you know, on Pinterest. Have a look at what the other people who are already following you, what they're talking about, and yeah. jump into those conversations. They're conversations that are already happening for people that are following you. So share similar interests to you, and you can create the, the, the you know, this, you can get to know people and get to know what they want. And then when they're after typesetting, photography, writing, then they're more likely to come to you. So it's a long burn thing, you know, and you, it, it's, you, you'll take, 18 months to get from a cold start to the point where you're developing regular business off it. But that will then be such a more sustainable model because you're building, you know, people that are genuinely into you and what you do rather than having to worry about, you know, constantly finding new business from people that have never heard of you and trying to convince them about who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the hard sell the whole time, you know, you've got people that are coming to you because they're fans of what you do and they've found you and they've discovered you and you've talked to them and you know them. And it's just, it's, it's much more fun, apart mm -hmm. from anything else, but it's much more effective, you know, in a purely business sense, it's just a more effective way of generating ROI from social media, because you've got these really powerful connections to people, you really know people. So where's a good place to network, face-to-face -face networking? Where would you, what would you do there? Again, it depends. Face-to-face -face is, is the best. Of, of, of all the social networks out there, actually yeah. talking to another human being is by far the best. Um, so I would say go to where the people are that are interested in your services and talk to them. So, I mean, there's brilliant things, for example, if you're in the wedding space where there's a whole bunch of events that go on around the wedding space. So, you know, venues put on. I, I went to a wedding venue recently with a client of mine who's getting married next March, and we had a walk around and sort of discovered where we wanted to take pictures and things like that. Um, but they do regular events where um, they invite a bunch Bunch of suppliers together and they put on like a whole wedding effect effectively apart from the actual wedding so um, you know you get there and there's a band playing and you can go and grab his business card there's caterers there and you can taste all the little volivons and stuff and you can grab their business card um, there's photographers there and you can grab their business card so it's you've got all of the people there uh, that are interested in weddings and then they invite all the clients in everybody that wants to get married or is considering getting married come to these events and then you can talk to them directly so find the spaces like that that are actually um, interested you know have the people that are interested in your service and go and talk to them you know the more the more it doesn't yeah it doesn't even have to be specific to what you do I mean the thing is that human beings have a wide range of, uh, of interests 
on the whole. So, um, you know, don't get bogged down into thinking that, um, you know, you need to be at a, at a wedding based uh, event in order to find wedding clients. Yeah. Right. Um, People that get married are, especially anybody, but you know, it might be perhaps you know nominally people most likely get married say between I don't know 20 and 40 years old. It tends to be probably uh, the the bride rather than the groom that, that tends to kind of book more of the services. So you're probably wanting to sort of find places where people that are kind of 20 to 40 and female are going to hang out. Depending on the type of wedding services that you or the, the type of wedding that you're trying to uh, aim at. Is going to determine the type of event that you go to. So if you're getting, if you're looking for like particularly high-end weddings, because what you charge is, you know, for a really premium service. I know what you do is handcrafted, and it takes a long time, and there's a premium for that because it's like top of the range stuff. So in those cases, you want to be finding. I mean, Goodwood, for example. Mm -hmm. when, you know, we, we both went to the Goodwood revival. I think you've seen a couple of videos that I've shot from there, and, and Katie was there on. We missed each other, I think, yeah. by a day, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, somewhere like that's great because you've got these, um, the, you know, high-earning individuals. They're all dressed. The nine, they're all having a great time. You know, if you can go to events like that and network with people there, you know, get it. It's possible to get booths there and, and and you know, sort of rent tents and spaces and things like that. You know, set up something where you're um, you, you 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 can make things like while people watch or, or do like a, a tutorial or get like kids to come and make things, and then you can talk to their you know parents and you know whatever it is. But but try and find places that aren't necessarily in the space that aren't crowded out necessarily also with other people that are in your space. Um, you know, find somewhat some unique way to get into this. So rather than thinking about, right, okay, it's weddings, think about, right, okay, it's 20 to 40 year old women who are very affluent and want the absolute premium wedding. You know, they're not going for the bargain basement stuff. They're going for, you know, glamorous, uh, you know, high quality premium goods and they want the services uh, and the supplies for that wedding to kind of meet that, you know. Yeah. So, so with marketing yourself mm. and advertising yourself, is there so, such a thing as too much advertising? Can you overkill it at all? I think the, the fear is that um, if you start just getting all up in people's grill, they just get sick of the sight of you. Yeah. And um, I think it just depends a lot on, on, the, on what you mean by those definitions. I think absolutely if you um, try and use social media like people in the old days used print platforms, then yes. Um, and that's where a lot of people kind of fall down on that. You know, they, they use them as distribution content for advertising. So, um, you know, the, it, it, if you get a, if you're signed up to like a page, and you start seeing, you know, like just a ton of adverts going 10% off trainers, buy now or lose out, last sale offer ends on Sunday, bang bang, and that's all you ever get. And they're just shouting messages at you the whole yeah. time. Yes, absolutely. I think in terms of, um, you know community building as a way to build client base and as a way to to market and as a way to get your brand equity built up so that people buy from you then absolutely not I mean you know the more that you can engage and the more people you can talk to the better you know it almost gets to the point where the, the difficulty becomes scaling it um, it, it becomes like a full-time job in itself it's all right when you've got 100 followers when you've got a million followers and you're trying to answer everybody's questions on Twitter it's much much harder to do and you probably will have to and again, this is really, uh, it comes back to what you're trying to build in terms of your, your company name. If your company name is mattwidgery.com, I haven't got a million followers, as you know, you lot, but if, I hope I do one day. And when I do, um, it's going to be a massive arsehole because I've got to try and respond to every single one of them myself because yeah. I can't hire somebody else to, to respond as Matt Widgery. Yeah. I've, I've kind of bitten off that and that's the that's the cross I've got to bear. You know, if I was an archaic image, an archaic image is a brand and anybody can respond and put that out so long as, you know, they're all on message and, you know, they're saying the, the, the right stuff and, you know, they don't say that social media is terrible and photography stinks and, you know, other things. Which I hope they wouldn't. I wouldn't hire them if they did. But that's the sort of thing. So, yeah, you know, you, people are fearful, I think, about the types of advertising that, um, that, that, that they're used to and that they hate and that make them cringe. And so I think that's probably where that question comes from. Tom, and I would say that if that's your fear, look at look at this other way of doing things, this 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 21st century way of doing things, or if you like this 19th century way of doing things, because that's how it was always done. If you wanted to build a business, you got to know people in your community. Yeah, you know, like and I think like you you never know when it, just talking to people in, in your day to day life, you don't know who's in the market for what. Mm. It's just dropping that that's what you do into the yeah. conversation at the right time. So you exactly. don't go into the pub and meet someone for the first time and I wouldn't go, hi, I'm Katie, I do typography. Yeah, exactly, that's it. Because <laughs> that's right. have a tagline yeah. Here's my business card. Yeah. Exactly, that's it. You know, you get in and you talk to people as a human being yeah. and then as it comes up in the natural flow of conversation, then you drop it in and by which point they've already worked out that Katie is a sound human being and, oh, okay, right, she does typography and then they'll remember yeah. that. And it's so long as you keep 
in their minds and, in, and you build that relationship up with them then at the point when they're ready to buy they will and you know it sounds like this kind of like long-winded process but believe me by the time you've got a thousand followers two thousand followers ten thousand followers you know th you are going to get the sales out of there because out of those people there's going to be people that are ready mm -hmm. you know and they're in your demographic and you're talking to the people in the right areas and they've already come to you and liked your page or subscribed to your YouTube channel or followed you on Twitter because they like what you do regardless of how they are in the buying cycle it's not like it's totally alien to them or something they'd never do presumably or they wouldn't have clicked <laughs> like or subscribe or whatever so just have faith that, that, that you know building the relationships is the right way you can. Yeah. Um, so this was a, a, a really big question for me, and, and I know a lot of you know startup businesses and creatives out there really kind of struggle, no matter what background they come from, mm. with this question: How do you value your work? Mm. How do you not only cover your materials and time, mm. but attract the right clientele and ensure that you are attracting new business at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, um, and it, for me as well, and I know we've had this conversation mm -hmm. um, about that fear of, of, of how much to charge the first time and, you know, how to, how to position yourself in the market. I think a lot of people go down the route uh, of, well, I'm, I'm new, therefore I'm inexperienced, therefore I'm going to find out what the other people in my area are charging and, and kind of be the same as there, like the cheapest ones are them, or maybe a little bit under because maybe I'm not quite, you know, mm -hmm. they've been obviously around for a while. Um, I think it's, that's a mistake because um, there'll be somebody else next week who undercuts you and you, you, they may well not have done the cost of doing business you know, calculations anyway to get and to arrive at that figure. So they may, they may not be doing it as a full-time job. They may have won the lottery the week before and are just doing it for fun. You don't know. So I think it's always very dangerous to try and sort of compete with the very bottom end of the market. Um, and with creative endeavors particularly and this is something that is kind of counterintuitive and I know it's going to get a lot of you know comments because it's something that's quite contentious but actually if you price yourself at the point where your clients recognize the value in your work that's when you're going to get the, 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 the money from with photography for example you know is there really such a big difference between a photographer that charges a thousand pounds for a headshot and ten thousand pounds for a headshot you know, it's provided that both are in focus, both are nicely lit, you know, you can get a decent expression out of someone and you can engage with people and you're good to work with. Um, you know, frankly, it's a good picture, right? Mm. Um, but there will be people out there that are looking for the premium products and they will want to spend the money to get the premium product. So um, position yourself where you want your target audience where your target audience is and where you want your business to come from, not where you think your experience level is. Because frankly, you know, somebody that's just picked up a camera could be amazing. Somebody that's been in the business for 30 years could be rubbish and jaded, but just really good at marketing. So it's not necessarily that just because you're new, your, your photography isn't as good as theirs. It might be way better than theirs. Um, so that's the first thing to think of. And the second thing is, you know, is your very baseline so that you're not absolutely undercutting yourself is to do your cost of doing business because, you know, it's really important. You know, people, um, when they first start out, they think, well, okay, you know, on my previous job I was earning, I don't know, 50 quid a day, 100 quid a day, whatever your day rate was for your previous job. Um, so, you know, the first time you kind of charge somebody like, you know, 150 quid or 250 quid for like a day's work, you think, that's amazing, I've done so well. Then you pay your tax, then you pay your rent on your studio, then you pay your materials costs, then you pay your travel, and then you're left with the bit that's left and it's a tenner. <laughs> you yeah. think, well, hang on a minute, something went really wrong here. And so um, that also, doing that cost of doing business so that you know your figures in your head so you know the minimum cost of doing business to get you the wage that you used to get is going to be 500 pounds for the day then that's your starting point that will give you the confidence to say okay well look I'm 500 pounds I'm a thousand pounds whatever it is and you know it's terrifying the first time you ask for the money you know but I mean you had a story didn't you recently yeah. of, of you know you were absolutely terrified because you thought that you know you're asking for much too much money it turned out they were going to pay you double I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> so yeah. it's having that confidence and, and, and that that's the thing as soon as you realize that people that are in business know this stuff it's only because you know when we're first starting out we're not necessarily aware of all the, the costs and just what the expenses mm -hmm. are that we're kind of scared of going into that world and asking for you know the bigger money um, but what you'll find is that in six months time you wouldn't take a job for what you took that job for you'll be on you know yeah. five times as much and you, you build up slowly um, so that's that. I mean, I would, I would always say, you know, value your work at, at a, as a bare minimum, your cost of doing business calculations so that you've 
built in a wage for yourself that you're yeah. you know that you know that your wage that you had for your last job um was uh whatever it was and that was enough to you know pay the car insurance and uh the mortgage and uh your phone bill and everything else and so you needed that money so don't you know don't take money from a job that is going to not allow you to do that same thing work out how many jobs you want to do you know it may well be that um the jobs that you do aren't particularly time consuming and so you can get 50 jobs done in a month in which case you don't need to charge as much per job as if you've got a job i mean like the um the, the wedding invitations that you've been doing which have been incredibly hand made and, and and take a long time to do you're not going to be able to get very many of those jobs done in a month and so therefore yeah. you're you need to value your time in doing that because you're not going to be able to book 10 jobs in in a month of that it's going to take a long time to complete um people recognize that you know people recognize that you know, for a, a for a talent, for a a, a, a vision, for a, a product that's unique, um, they're gonna ha they're gonna have to pay something that's not just getting the cheap ones off the shelves in Tesco's, and they won't want to spend those sort of prices. Yeah. You know, particularly in the wedding sphere. The wedding sphere is an interesting one because, um, like photography, for example, you know, um, wedding photographers range from five hundred to uh, you know ten grand. You know, in this country, roughly, there's some either side. But um, if you, as a bride, have gone to dad and dad's given you a budget of 20 grand for the wedding and he's given you and out of that two grand for the wedding photographer there's no way you're spending 500 quid or a thousand or 1500 or even 1999 pounds 99 pounds 99p you're spending two grand on that wedding photographer in fact what you're probably going to do is spend two and a half grand and go back to dad for the other 500 quid <laughs> you go dad i really like this it looks amazing and they do these tin plate prints and it looks cool i have to have the extra money and dad will go oh it's my one and only daughter of course you are there we go so they'll probably if anything they'll overspend yeah. so um you know just be aware that people when they want something premium are, are ready to spend on it uh, and, yeah. and, and price itself that way. And I think that was something that I, I, I took massive inspiration from one of our talks we had previous was, uh, you know, with it, when it comes to invitations, if people want to spend five pounds and get mm. 50 invitations, mm. they will go and buy them yeah. elsewhere where yeah. they can get them cheaply done. Exactly. Like that. Mass produced, printed stuff, you know. And is that going to be my, my client basis of sure. people that want those kind of invitations yeah, exactly. when my stuff is all hand created? Mm. And, and, and that really kind of, you know, was something that I drew, you know, drew from and thought, well, no, you know, these are the people that I, I want to be working for. Yeah. And so, you know, that, you know, that, that really helped me out. So. Cool. Well, it comes down to really knowing your client yeah. base and who your target audience is. And, and you, you have to sort of um, work out for yourself as a creative who who your work is for and who you want to be talking to with it. So, you know, absolutely, you know, you're, you're never going to be in the space where people are, are buying a pack of 50 invitations for a fiver. You know, that stuff exists, but you know, it's not a market that, that you're gonna be interested in doing, that you can make any money doing, that will be fun to do, that will give you the type of lifestyle that you want from it. You yeah. know, whereas if you target the premium end of the market, they're gonna value what you do, they're gonna pay for it, and they're gonna give you the money to, because you know, they're, they're gonna pay for you to have the lifestyle that allows you to move in those circles and create and, and connect with those clients. So, you know, if, you're, if you want to, you know, get the, 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 the high rollers that are out there, you know, you're gonna have to, you know, book a lunch with them at Claridge's. That means you're gonna have to spend more than somebody that, you know, they're gonna have lunch at, at, at you know, you're gonna meet them for a Starbucks. Yeah. You know, it's a different it's a different market, it's a different audience. So you have to kind of know who your people are. And, and, and you know, it's so important. And, um, you know, I, I think that what was really cool is that after the meeting that we had, when we first talked about this, you had a, a, a big project that was just about to drop and you were just about to talk money I think with the yeah. money and you you were out there and you you delivered the price and what happened yeah got the job got the job happy with it yeah really happy yeah. with yeah. it fantastic <laughs> and this is it so it's it, that will now give you that's in your tool chest now yeah that's in your armory you know that that people are going to pay that it's not this well I, I wonder if anybody's nobody's going to pay that much money do people pay that much money for it yeah. and then, then they know yeah they do and they're happy with it and they're delighted you know yeah. they're really happy with the work so yeah fantastic Right, so we're on to the last question. Oh, flown uh, by. Us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when do you know that it's time to, you've got your nine to five um, and you know that you can go, right, when do you know this is the mm. right time to go, I can fully be funding myself here? And independent. And independent. You know, the biggest, um, the, the biggest challenge is, uh, is making that leap and you can do it. You can do it the way I did it, which was which was jumping at it a bit. I'd kind of planned to do it, but I jumped a bit quick, um, and so I, I spent catch up. I had enough 
clients to last me. I was booked up for a couple of months. I knew that was good, um, but I really hadn't done anything while I was still in full-time employment to really start building that pipeline up. I hadn't started building this uh, this community up. You know, I'm still I, I'm building it now. So it's kind of gone from zero up to, and it's it's still building now. So um, in an ideal world, I would have been at the point probably six months from where I am now in terms of my community before I you know stopped earning regular money that would have been the sensible thing to do um, I jumped a little bit um, I, I got a bit frustrated with where you know I was working and just wanted to go and I thought well I've got a couple of clients a couple of months booking so um, that'll tie me over and I've been lucky you know I've, I, I've, I've, I've hit all my bills every month and I've been okay and the, the stuff the work still keeps coming in which is great uh, long may that continue but I would recommend that if you're thinking about doing something uh, full time and want to get the foundations, start now, if you haven't already done it, start building your community up because your community is where everything is going to grow from. So start talking to people more than you've ever talked to before on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram, wherever you play, wherever is comfortable for you and, and find... You don't, you don't, contrary to opinion, to, you know, popular opinion, you don't have to be everywhere. Find the places where you can play and be comfortable and, they, and that talk your language. So, for me, I've got a mouth on me. I, YouTube is perfect. You know, I can rab it. You know, I, so this, this works really well for me. Um, I haven't got the patience to do, I used to do blogging. I haven't got the patience or the time, frankly, to sit down and spend five hours writing articles about stuff. So... I've kind of moved away from doing that side of things. Um, some people, I mean, photographers, obviously, you know, we're very visual creatures and designers. You know, something like Instagram, something like Pinterest, where we can really sort of, you know, create fantastic visuals for people are brilliant. You know, find, find a place you can play and then really, really now, while you've still got regular money coming in, build up the people that you're talking to and get that support, get that knowledge out for what you're doing. Because that's so, so important. Because then at some point, and it's not like I can sit down and say, well, okay, when you've got a thousand followers on YouTube or when you've got, uh, you know, a thousand likes on Facebook, or whatever, that's the time, because it depends on what you're doing. Someone like you who's attracting high end people, it may well be that you actually don't need that many people, you know, in your in your community for you to be profitable because each individual person is going to be high net worth to you and they're actually going to give you a decent chunk of what your earning is you know what your necessary earning is for that um you know financial period but if you're um if you're if you're playing in a space that has uh, you, you need to turn over a lot more individual jobs then you need to grow that community more so again it comes down to figuring out what your market is and who the people that are that you're talking to so you know that's it really, I mean build, build what you've got and, and build it to the point where you know that there's money coming in and it's a consistent coming in, it's been coming in for a while. The downside to that is that it means that as well as doing your 9 to 5, you're going to be doing another 9 to 5 when you get home. Yep. Um, you'll get home from work at 5 and you'll be still working at 3 in the morning. Um, the even more downside is that when you do finally go full time it'll get worse. <laughs> you'll, do, you'll be doing more hours. I mean, you know, I, I, I was so looking forward to stop quitting my PR job and doing the photography full time because it's so hard doing two jobs. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. I can't believe that I've, you know, um, but the reality is I, I work harder and longer hours and I don't get weekends and don't expect to have any time off either. Expect to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. You can't get sick because there's nobody to take the phones and do the emails and answer the. I mean, you need to just be there and do it. And, you know, and, and probably for three to five years, you know, until you get yourself, you know, established, that's the case. So, sorry for, you know, uh, there's no shortcut is the answer, you know, for those people that are out there looking for this kind of, you know, and, and so many people are, you know, 10 quick steps to being a millionaire. And, you know, if you buy my book on business success, you'll get a helicopter in three months. It's not true, unfortunately, for most people, yeah. you know, you, it, it's graft and it takes years and it's hard work and it'll shorten your life. So that's, <laughs> that's the downside. But it's your passion. But it's your passion. And yeah. that's it. And if it is your passion, then you won't care about yeah. any of that stuff. Um, I think, was it Aristotle that said, if you find something you love doing, you'll, uh, if you find a job you love doing, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And it's that, you know. So if you're really, really passionate about it, you'll love it. And you'll love the customer complaints. And you'll love the tax returns. And you'll love doing the you know making the computer work when it's broken again you'll love all that stuff because it's part you'll, you'll be in the marathon you'll be looking that stuff's just not important because i'm all about yeah. you know building something that's going to last you know for the rest of my life and make me happy for the you know till the day i've dropped dead and can't do it anymore <laughs> <Brilliant>. <laughs> so that's it <laughs>
fantastic. That's all the questions. Cool. Right. Great stuff. Well, listen, thank you very much, Katie, thank for um, doing a brilliant job presenting all those questions. And, and um, I think they are the questions that uh, will be hopefully a lot of the things that you guys um, will be have been asking. I know they were questions that I had been asking myself. And um, yeah, I wish there was a way of beaming back this video. Uh, to <laughs> I've changed a whole lot of stuff and done it differently. You know, so that's it. Well, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget in the comments underneath um, to tell us what you thought of the video and um, ask any more questions because, um, you know, I'll be happy to answer any more that come up. So if you've got any questions about, um, you know, how to start in business or anything about what we've been talking about here, leave all those um, up there. In that box there, there's a big red button and it says subscribe on it. Please jab at that frantically until your fingers go red raw. It really, really helps. The more subscribers I get on this, the more I can build this channel. It gets me more scope to do more cool stuff like this and help you guys out with some more videos. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.